Um, I'd like us to turn to Psalm 89, please. The 89th Psalm. I don't really have uh, any great uh, I don't know, have notes or a, or a sort of a, a point or theme to this I just feel that the Lord wants us to look into this and just as it comes we might not get past the first few verses or we, we may go much deeper but I just feel the Lord wants us to revisit Psalm 89, the importance of it to reiterate to us why it's important um, and just take it from there so let's just read from verse 1 I will sing of the mercies of Yahweh or Jehovah forever with my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations Okay. I will sing of the mercies of Yahweh forever now I want to say a couple of things about that because this is of course a song about David and the Davidic line, the Davidic succession, the Davidic throne, the Davidic covenant. Saul was king before David. And Saul messed up. Because he messed up, God rejected him from being king. And said, we need to find someone else. And he knew of a wee shepherd boy. Okay? That somehow or other got God's attention way out in the fields with the sheep. God knows where the true leaders are. God knows where the answer to the nation is. God knows where the people are that can get the job done. But you have to get God's attention. If you want to be one of those people, you have to get his attention. David was a worshipper. And he got God's attention. Because God looks on the heart. Okay? And so when God is scanning to and fro throughout the earth looking at people. He's not looking at what you're doing, he's looking at your heart. And David had something in his heart that got God's attention. But here's why we're saying, I'll sing the mercy of Yahweh forever, because Saul, Saul didn't have what David had, because Saul messed up and God says, can't have him, he's no use. So we need to get someone better. But God knew, well, whoever I get is going to be imperfect, they're going to mess up, they're going to, you know, we can't expect that they'll be totally perfect. So we have to have a situation where whoever the king is, the minute they mess up, I can't just keep bouncing them out and bringing someone else in. I have to have a different tack to this. Okay? So God made a covenant with David. Which bound God to sticking with David and his seed after him, regardless of what happened. Okay? But also, he says, I have to show mercy. I have to bring into this my mercies. Didn't show much mercy to Saul. You see that? Didn't have a covenant with Saul. And mercies weren't part of it. It was as you, you know, you messed up, you're sacked. And so, I will sing of the mercies of Yahweh forever, simply saying, we're bringing, before we do anything else, let's bring this remembrance to Yahweh that David and his line exist under a canopy of mercy. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. What that means is that God is faithful to his covenant with David to all generations. Well, why would that matter? You see, mainstream Christianity would tell you, well, that applies to Jesus. And of course it does. Jesus is the, David's greater son. And, it, you know, he is eternally in this Davidic covenant as, as a son of David. His, the faithfulness of Yahweh would, of course, be eternally with Jesus the Messiah, the, the uh, eternally destined incumbent of the Davidic throne. Of course. But it doesn't just mean that. It means all generations in history. So the line of David's seed, the succession of that throne, they are all part of the Davidic covenant. They are all, in other words, it doesn't matter how far away from David you go, 
i.e. it is now about 3,000 years later, the faithfulness of God is that he will stick to what he said to David 3,000 years ago and uphold that throne. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness shall be established in the very heavens. Mercy shall be built up. Mercy shall be accumulated, built up. It's there for all time. And the, the faithfulness of God is established in the very heavens. In other words, this transcends earth. It's an eternal thing. Do you see that? And also the fact that God made a covenant with David that as long as the sun and moon endured, David would not want a man to sit on the throne. What it means is as long as the sun and the moon are in the sky, you can expect to see a descendant of David sitting on the throne of David. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant. Your seed will I establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Salah. Now, Salah is a Hebrew word that is very similar to another Hebrew word, Salah, which means rock. And we know that it is the rock of Israel, which is Christ, that was carried through the wilderness, the stone of destiny, that monarchs of Israel are seated upon at their coronation. So he's saying here, I will build up your throne to all generations. The throne is built by the stone of destiny, by Jacob's pillar stone. And that's when he says Salah, which means pause for thought, think about this. It's very similar to that, that word rock in Hebrew. So there's a double, there's a, you understand there's a plain words here. How does God build up the throne? By the rock, which is Christ, by the stone of destiny. Think about that. Salah. Do you mean Salah, think about it, or Salah, the rock? Both. Think about the rock. Do you see that? All right, let's move on. And the heavens shall praise your wonders, Yahweh, your faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. You see, God intends that in the congregation of the saints, this is known. The throne of David is known. The perpetuity of David's seed is known. The eternal aspect of that throne in terms of planet earth is always going to be there as long as sun and moon endure is known in the congregation of the saints oh but Christians don't know about this pastor therein lieth the problem we know it others know it problem is most don't know it am I right? for who in the heaven can be compared to Yahweh? who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to Yahweh? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. What's that got to do with the throne of David? Honour the king. Sorry, honour all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honour the king. Honouring the king and fear God are that second half of the key. In other words, fearing God and honouring the king come together. And, and the Bible says, you know, you're supposed to fear Yahweh and honour the king. And don't meddle with those that are given to change. Fearing God and honour the king are linked in scripture. So God is greater to be feared in the assembly of the saints, which means ecclesia, church. And to be had in reverence. If, if church isn't teaching reverence about God, by teaching the key of David and honouring the king, the throne of David, then it isn't church. Oh, pastor, that's a controversial one. Well, I, I'm, I'm, you know, people, people walk to the light they have. I, I've been in that place. I've been in the place where, I, where, 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 where mighty things were happening, wonderful things, church was happening, people were being saved, and all wonderful things were taking place, as we all have. You know, good old-fashioned church meetings, Holy Ghost meetings, salvation meetings, healing meetings. Oh, was God present? Yes, he was. 
Why? Because God is, God is gracious. But was it church? Well, you see, if you've had church like that without the, the, the key of David, and you've had church with the key of David, then you have to be honest and say, it wasn't church as it's meant to be. It wasn't the assembly, it wasn't the ecclesia. Why? Because the reverence that, that, that is due God by linking it to the honour of the king, i.e. the throne of David, in the midst. That wasn't there. People didn't know. But if they know, they didn't say. If they knew, they didn't say. Do you understand this? Where there is no revelation of the key of David, it's not really, really church. Because God is not... This word fear in God means to revere him. Okay? And what that means is to deeply honour him, to deeply revere You're not honouring God if you don't know about the key of David. Well, it's not their fault they don't know, Pastor. Well, sometimes it is, folks. Because you don't want to know. You see, lack of my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, it goes on to say. I will reject them. Oh, but it's not a sin to not know. Yes, it is. If you're not knowing comes from closing your mind. Or closing your heart. To the revelation of the Spirit that will lead you to the key of David. That's tough. Well, I didn't make up the rules. Yahweh God, the fourth verse 8, who is a strong Yahweh like to you or to your faithfulness round about you. You know, it makes a lot of sense when you say, Oh Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like to you? Or to your faithfulness round about you. That makes sense, doesn't it? But it doesn't make sense to say, Oh Yahweh God of hosts, who is a strong Yahweh like to you or to your faithfulness round about you? That doesn't make sense, does it, in English? But that's what it says. When you take away the word Lord, which is in effect tipexed in because of the scribes, and understand that the word Lord in capital letters is really saying Yahweh or Jehovah. It's the, it's the tetragrammaton, the, the, the hidden name of the Lord, or hidden name of God. You see, a lot of things that don't make sense to Sardis folks make sense to Philadelphia folks. Why? Because Philadelphia folks... Let's turn over to Revelation chapter. Keep your finger there. Turn over to Revelation chapter three, and I'll show you this. That doesn't make sense. Let's let's read it again as it says it in the, in, the, in our word here in our Bibles. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like to you, or to your faithfulness round about you? Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Who is a strong Lord like the Lord? Nobody. But that's not what it says. O Yahweh. Elohim of armies who is a strong Yahweh like to you Yahweh is a name not a title it's like saying well who's a strong king like our king ok so your, your king was called William ok who's a strong king like our William like our king that, that makes sense but if you said O King William, who is a strong William like you? That doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? You know why? Because we know God too much by his title and not enough by his name. But if you knew his name, that makes perfect sense. Oh, Shakamingo. Oof, haven't they? Hold it in you. Revelation chapter 3. Oh, dear me. Well, we know about Philadelphia, but I just want to show you this very quickly, okay? Uh, verse 12. Him that overcomes, this is Philadelphia Church, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, he shall no, uh, go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Okay? Verse 8. You have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. The name of God, Yahweh, is so important to Philadelphia. And we don't deny it. We don't say, well, let's just use the word Lord here because it's a whole lot easier. Or most mainstream Christians would say, well, you don't really want to talk about that Yahweh business or that Jehovah business. You know, you might think, people might think you're a Jehovah's Witness if you talk about Jehovah too much. 
And the name Yahweh. Well, that's just confusing people, Pastor. Just read what it says. It says Lord, just read Lord. Well, it says Lord, but it shouldn't. And in some good Bibles, it's, it's properly written. Does that make sense? You rule the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, you still them. The sea being, of course, symbolic of the world economy. The world, the nations, the, the whole system of the world. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your strong arm. Rahab is, of course, symbolic of Egypt, but is also prophetically symbolic of the great harlot Babylon, because, of course, Rahab is, is the name that, uh, of the harlot. It means proud, proud harlot, just like Mr. Babylon. So, in other words, the manifestation of, of Rahab in the sea when God parted the sea and destroyed Egypt. That was one manifestation of that Babylon, harlot, Rahab spirit, if that makes sense, that comes against the people of God. The eighth beast out of the sea, mystery Babylon, rides the beast in Revelation chapter 8. In other words, at different periods in history, different empires or systems have risen up to destroy God's people and God has always cut them down and destroyed them. And the last manifestation in Revelation 17, 18 is Babylon, the, which mystery Babylon rides the eighth beast. Okay? Uh, Egypt uh, being uh, the first beast. But in other words, he's speaking here not just about what happened in the past, but this is a, in other words, what he's really saying is, you did it before, any time this thing rises up, you'll destroy them, Lord. The heavens are yours, verse 11, the earth also is yours, as for the world and the fullness thereof, you have founded it. But I thought that the world belonged to Satan, Pastor. Well, Satan's the prince of this world, he's the god of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. In other words, Satan was given a measure of jurisdiction over the planet because of the fall of Adam. He usurped the authority that God gave to Adam. And when I say usurped it, in a legitimate way because Adam, in effect, bowed the knee to Satan and allowed Satan to, to, to have dominion. But Jesus, you have to understand, Jesus took that back. Satan is no longer God or ruler over this world. He, he may be the God of this world because most people maybe follow him and serve him. But there's a big difference between God of something and God over something. Jesus is Lord of our lives, but he's Lord over everybody else too. Okay, now we own him as Lord and other people don't own him as Lord but that's too tough because they're still Lord. It's a little bit like her Queen. A lot of people in Britain don't like the Queen. But they're still her subjects whether they like it or not. And we're still God's citizens, subjects whether we like it or not. Because why? The heavens are his and the earth is his. He is the ultimate owner. If that makes sense. Satan was only ever um, a factor. Factors don't own the building, they just have some kind of jurisdiction over it. Amen? And, and it's the owner who decides <laughs> who the factor is. Okay? Satan's contract has ended. He's out of a job. He's now self-employed. He's always been self-employed since he rebelled anyway. Anyway. The north and the south you have created them. Tabor and Hermon shall rejoice in your name. You know, the north and the south. That's so important. Because what it tells us is that God has fixed things. So that there's a north and there's a south. You know... People speak about, you know, your, your, your North Star or, or True North, meaning 
that, that there's a fixed point that you have in your life that you can say that's my true north or, or you know and men can always navigate both on land and sea but by, 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 the, by the, the heavens and by you know the north stars does that make sense so in other words God has established things and put them in order, set them in order. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high as your right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation or the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your face. Now, that's important. Notice here that mercy and truth are linked together. They're linked together quite a lot in other places too. Mercy and truth, grace and truth. A lot of people think that, that judgment and truth go together. But it's mercy and truth that go together. Justice and judgment are the foundation. But mercy and truth go before God's face. What does that mean? It means that as you approach God, you need mercy. Why? Because you know he's hard-nosed. You know that justice and judgment are the foundation of his throne. But you need mercy as you approach him on the throne. You see that? That's so important to understand. A lot of people want to put the justice and judgment out there. But they don't understand God saying, I put mercy and truth out there. Okay? We're not here to run moral crusades or ethical campaigns. We're here to reconcile people to God. Which means we, we must, by necessity, function and operate in a mercy spirit, not a judgmental one. Honour all men. Love the brotherhood. That doesn't come from a place of, you know, let's rain fire and brimstone down on them. You know, when, when Jesus' disciples decided, well, you know, we don't like them in that village, let's, let's blast them. Jesus was reminding them. We've called them the sons of thunder. That's not the spirit. That's not the right way. You don't know what kind of spirit you're of, you And if we're the same, well, we have all those hell-deserving, hell-bound sinners. Well, there's something wrong. Because mercy and truth go before his face. Blessed is the people that know the joyful sound. They shall walk, Yahweh, in the light of your countenance or presence. In your name shall they rejoice all the day, and in your righteousness shall they be exalted. For you are the glory of their strength and your favour. Our horn or our strength shall be exalted. Now here we're getting into the, the, the meaty part of us. For Yahweh is our defence, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. This is so important. Because God here, but the Holy Spirit, is leading us into a section of this psalm. And it's so important to enter this section the right way, because messing this up has caused the bloodshed and pain and heartache and misery of many of God's people here in Israel, Britain over the centuries and in Bible times because if you remember the whole thing about the, the covenant in times here in Scotland the covenanters did not reject the earthly king you know they didn't reject the concept of having an earthly king it was the Stuart kings at the time they didn't say well we don't want any human kings they, they weren't anti-royalists what they wanted was a king that would have a king and have it bow the knee to heaven's higher king they were happy to have a king provided that king led the people in the worship of God and, and the example of holiness and so on. They wanted a king. So when they had the whole business of the, the solemn leading covenant, the national covenant, they, they decided that they wanted Charles uh, II when he, when he came back to sign that covenant. But if you remember the whole thing that the covenanters was, first and foremost they spoke about the crown rights of King Jesus. What they were in effect saying was, we'll have a human king. But we want everybody to understand that above that king, there's an eternal king, which is King Jesus. He's the true king of Scotland. The true king of, you know, well, Scotland, because it was Scotland at that particular time. There was the Union of Crowns, but it wasn't quite Britain. But they also did impose upon the English and the Irish the, the covenant. 
because they were very shrewd and clever. And when the uh, Puritans wanted their help to defeat the first challenge, they made them sign the covenant. Now, why is that important? Because if we don't get that God is our king above any human king, we'll miss the whole thing. And if we miss the whole thing, we miss the whole point. Because what happens is, the Stuarts themselves, they believe in the divine right of kings. But the problem was that it was almost as if they didn't... It wasn't like, well, God has caused us to rule and you'll do what we say. It was, it was almost like they were putting themselves in the place of God. That They took the divine right of kings way too far. Because they didn't have God as their king in the proper way. Does that make sense? If you have a king or a monarch that doesn't bow the knee to heaven's higher kingdom, you have a problem. And that's why we have democracies and republics and so on, because man wants to sit in the, the temple of God as God. That's not just about popes and, and other sinister antichrist characters. Every single leader of a nation who does not bow the knee to King Jesus is somebody who's usurping the place of King Jesus. That's why our vision for, for, for the, the shepherd king is Jesus reigning on the throne of David in the king, the, 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 the earthly king, the human king, the descendant of David. But, but that descendant of David, being a born again Christian, having Jesus Christ live in him, that's our vision. And that vision is right here in Psalm 89. Because first and foremost, you know, well, Yahweh is our true king. He's our heavenly king. He's, our, he's, he's king over the whole nation. Then you spoke in vision to your holy one. And said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Now, let me just say this to you. Okay, this is important to see here. Yahweh is our defence and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Now I believe that's talking about Yahweh. You could turn around and say, but what it means is Yahweh is our defence and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Because the Holy One here is clearly David. Because he says, then you spoke in vision to your Holy One and said, I have laid hell upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. So who's the Holy One? Yahweh is our defence and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then I spoke, you spoke in vision to your Holy One. Who's the Holy One? I've just said that they started off by saying, well, Yahweh is our king. God is our king. God is the king of the nation. Right? And I said that the covenant said the same thing. Jesus is Lord over. He's the king of Scotland. Christ's uh, crown rights. Now, the Holy One of Israel, we say, well, that's, that's the Lord. That's God. That's Yahweh. But he says, then you spoke in vision to your Holy now is he talking about David? No, because he's talking the third person. He says, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. What I believe that God is saying here, and, and, I, and I have to make this very plain, the Holy One of Israel, is that God, well, he is the Holy One of Israel. But we have Yahweh talking to the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is our King. Now, is David the Holy One of Israel? Well, yes, in that he's been set apart, he's the Lord's anointed, he's, yes, but he's, he's, he's talking to someone else about David. You see that? Yahweh is talking to somebody else who's called the Holy One of Israel about David. And the answer is, it's the Lord Jesus. So what he's saying is, Yahweh's our defence, and the Holy One of Israel, King Jesus is the King of Israel. Before he was made flesh. You see that? 
And I believe the whole living of Israel is David and his descendants. <coughs> if that makes sense. Because they're holy and that they've been set apart. And, and because David is, is sorry, Jesus is David's greater son. And, and, and we know that Jesus, as well as being the pre incarnate word, is also a descendant of David. And as, and as Jesus asked the question, well, if, if the Messiah, if Christ is David's son, well, why would you call him Lord? Because he's pre incarnate and he's the king of Israel. You see that? It's so important. Now, D David was anointed to be king, and Jesus was destined to be king of Israel in the line and succession of David. So the Holy One of Israel. Yes, can be applied to David himself and all the descendants. Because Dave, Jesus is the son of David. And if he's the Holy One of Israel, then so also is, is David. Now, what I'm putting all that together, because we're, we're quite a wee bit around it, but it's important to say this. The Holy One of Israel is a divine title. That is given, I believe, to a divine person, being the Lord Jesus. And he is, of course, God. Isn't he? I have laid help upon one that is mighty, I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. Now, this faithfulness abounds to all generations, and, and, and this is for every descendant of David. Can we expect that people who hate the present incumbent of David's throne, Queen Elizabeth, can we expect that God's going, going to plague these people? Yes. But should we be praying into that? Haters. What is our biggest problem? The thorn in our flesh. The thorns in our side are haters. And what do they hate? They hate the throne. They hate David. They hate the Davidic throne, and if they hate David, they're going to hate his descendants. They hate the Holy One of Israel. <coughs> but I know Christians that want independence, want to be free. I know Christians, listen, I've, I've, I know Christians that claim to hate the Queen. Or hate the throne, hate the, hate the monarchy. Well, they claim to be Christians, you see. But but how this is this is the whole point. This is this is this is the the, the the big problem here because this whole business about the throne of David is supposed to be known in the assembly of the saints. The fear of God and the honour of the king is supposed to be in the assembly of the saints. So how can it be in the assembly of the saints if the saints don't know? Don't care. Or do care, but hate the monarchy. We are not saints, folks. Oh, you're saying they're not Christians. Well, I, what I am saying is, they're not in the assembly of the saints that he's speaking about here. <coughs> because it says, God is greatly to be feared, revered, honoured in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence. Now, they, they may be saints in that they got born again, but they're not acting like it, okay? Now, what I'm saying to you is, well, does that impinge upon their eternal <coughs> salvation? That's down to their Saviour. 
But, but let's just say folks that are saved or act like folks that are saved. Am I right? And if they don't, then it's God that they have to deal with. Judgment will begin at the house of God. And if they're hairs, then God will put down. Let me just say this to you. We have a wee problem here. God is going to plague people. That's Old Testament, Pastor. Don't you know in the New Covenant, you're not going to be preaching on that legalism, are you? You're not going to be one of those old Pharisees preaching that God sends plagues on people. Don't you know that's Old Covenant? I know it's Bible. But I also know in the New Covenant, God still plagues people. Who does he plague? Let's turn to Revelation 18 and find out. <clears throat> the Holy One of Israel, Jesus, is the true King of Israel. He is God. And, God say, and, and Yahweh says to Jesus, I found someone. I found the guy. I finally, that Saul, he was a dad, wasn't he? Yes, he, he, he wasn't the right choice, okay? He didn't get through to the final round, okay? He was an X-factor dropout. Well, he did get through to the because he was an anointed king, but he failed, okay? He, he had his contract pulled. And, and, and Yahweh says to, the whole, to Jesus, I found someone, and I've, I've, I've anointed him. Amen. That's, that's the counsel of the Godhead. Chapter 18, Revelation. Verse 4. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, speaking about mystery Babylon, and that you receive not of, of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, God has remembered her, and reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double to her double according to her works, and the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. Verse 7. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Oh, God doesn't judge in this new covenant. Sorry, folks. Your argument just blew apart by scripture. God doesn't send plagues in the new covenant. He just plagued Babylon. Big time. And who else does he plague? Them that hate the throne of David. So does Babylon hate the throne of David? You better believe it. And, but, and who's he saying? Come out for my people. Christians in Babylon, pastor? Surely not. Yes, Revelation 18 says so. And if they don't get out of that throne of David hating spirit, and that Babylonian all men are equal, let's have democracy, and let's not bother with having monarchy attitude, then the plagues are coming. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Now I know a lot of people like to, to, to read their favorite, you know, a lot of people aren't Word of God people, their favorite Word of God people. But we're Word of God people, aren't we? But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, with David, and in my name shall his authority, his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. Why the sea? Why the rivers? The, the many waters of the earth. Because that's where Babylon tries to sit. Amen? And God's right hand is the throne of David. With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. I will set his hand also in the sea. Why? Because the hand of the Davidic monarch is the hand of God in the earth. You, you maybe didn't see the program Game of Thrones that was on. The, 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 the books are big sellers. It was one of these kind of uh, like a fantasy type thing, Lord of the Rings, but, but very much with much more mature themes. A lot of it you shouldn't really watch. It's quite, you know. But anyway, the, the theme in the, the thing uh, or part of the story is that the, the, the king of the realm has a right hand man 
and he's always called the hand of the king and he wears a wee badge it's a hand okay now the, the king or queen that sits on the throne of David is the hand of God in the earth you know that that, that person is authorised to do the will of the king well the incumbent of the throne of David is the hand of Jesus in the earth in terms of dominion over the planet that's why it says I put him his hand in the sea and his right hand in the rivers because that means the world system the world economy okay he shall cry to me you are my father my God and the rock of my salvation also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth oh my goodness does the president of America know this does the Pope of Rome know this does the EU president, does, does the, the UN, what's the, the, the general secretary of the UN know this? Does the head of the Politburo know this? Does the, the head of uh, all the other nations, do they, do they know this? Do the presidents and prime ministers, and, do they know that God's already picked someone to be the highest authority on planet Earth? Are they aware of this? Yes, a president is a leader of the free world, brother. In your dreams, cowboy. God has picked. God has already set his king on the holy hill of Zion. Now you say, well, that's messianic, past. that's all about Jesus. Yes, it is. But if you go and study it, and there's a lot of scholars who back this up, go and read your commentaries, you'll find that they say that that Psalm 2 is the primary application is to David and the Davidic kings in succession. Yes, it has an ultimate fulfilment in Jesus, but it has a historical fulfilment in the incumbent of the throne of David. So the highest authority, governmentally speaking, on planet Earth, is whoever sits on the throne of David. And if that person is somebody who allows God to flow in their lives, like we've had good monarchs, then we see that manifest. And we saw it manifest in the Victorian era at the height of the British Empire. A queen who certainly honoured the Lord and believed in this message and believed herself to be the descendant of King David. And that, that empire that she presided over was, as Scripture predicted, the most powerful kingdom in history on the face of the globe. The stone kingdom. The great mountain that filled the whole earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore and my covenant shall stand fast with him. What's God saying? It won't be like Saul because if this guy messes up we can't go back to the drawing board again. We have to stick with this man. Okay? His seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. You notice he says, I'll make it to endure. It's in God's hands, not ours. Now, should we pray for the king? Yeah, sure. But, you know, it's, it's actually God's responsibility because parts of the Davidic covenant are, 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 are they're not conditional. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not commandment, in other words, if they're duds, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will not utterly take from me, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will not break, nor alter the thing that's going out my lips. Now, what he's saying here is this, okay? If these guys mess up that are on the throne, if, if they're not up to par, and we've seen plenty of that in, in our history and also Bible times, not every king of Judah was good. In fact, it was said to Solomon that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. That was his, that was his report card. Okay, started off so well, but ended up so poorly. God's saying, if these guys aren't up to par, then you, you're going to notice it. There'll be judgment, there'll be th things will go wrong, the, the nation will suffer for it. But I won't break the covenant by just sweeping them off the throne, and nobody else will either. I won't alter that, that which is going out of my lips. 
Once have I sworn by my holiness, and I will not that I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne is the sun before me. In other words, can you look out and see the sun? Yeah, still there. And the throne still there. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven, Salah. In other words, if there's a sun in the sky and there's a moon in the sky, then you know that the throne of David is still on the earth. Amen? Then he goes on, a big long section, you've cast off and abhorred, you've been angry with your anointed. This is all about Israel in declension. Really, what he's, he, he starts to get quite specific about, and you see, well, he spent a lot of verses from verse 38 to 52, talking about pretty much of verse 50, 50, 51, where he says, you know, he's talking about all the, the declension and the decline and the, the bad stuff. What, what, why does he spend so long talking about that? Because quite frankly, we haven't always been ruled over by godly, holy men upon the throne of David. But it's still the standard. And he starts to list all the things that you've made his glory to cease and cast his throne down to the ground, verse 44. That literally means he's made his, he's put his glory into abeyance or, or storage, if you like. Now, nah, if you saw that in a vision, the Lord showed me that in a vision. The, the glory of Britain is stored up. I saw it very clear. I can still see clearly in my mind what the Lord showed me. Just lots of things in this big massive hangar and they're just all there in storage. He said, oh, well, will they ever come back out? Well, if you get a good king on the throne, good monarch on the throne. Well, what about Queen Elizabeth? Is she a bad monarch? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is, when God gets somebody on the throne of David, with a heart like David, and someone who's sold out to him, then all that stuff will start coming back out of storage and come back into manifestation in Britain. That's what I believe. That's why we, we believe God for a shepherd king. For a king who's just like David. And you know, let's be honest, David was an utter. You know, David danced naked before the Lord. Now if that happened to, to like, imagine Sky Sports, uh, Sky News, if tonight it was announced that you know um, the King of Britain or the, the heir to the throne was caught dancing naked, and someone said, "What are you doing that But I'm just, I'm so full of the, the joy of the Lord. And someone said, "Well, it's vulgar to dance naked, don't you know that?" Well, I'll be yet uh, more vulgar still, because that's what David said when they said to him, "What's this dancing naked before the Lord?" Now, we already think Prince Charles is nuts because he talks to, to trees. Imagine, you know, we had a, a, a royal prince that prayed all the time, didn't care who heard or who saw. You know, if you think he's nuts for talking to trees, what are you going to say when he says, we talking to him? I'm talking to my king up in heaven, the Holy One of Israel. You know, they certify George III as mad. You know that? Now you have to know why they did that too. But that's another story. Okay? Let's just say that they don't like when they discover a king or a queen who gets a little bit too zealous in the footsteps of their forefather David. They don't like that. All right. Well, we'll leave it there, folks. But what I, what I do want to say, the Lord wants us to understand. We have, we have the vision that he's given us, but that vision isn't just some pie-in-the-sky thing. That vision is so deeply rooted in the Word of God because as long as Psalm 89 is in your Bible, then you can read, and in other places where God says, this is an eternal covenant in the sense that if there's a sun in the sky and there's a moon in the sky, then there'll be a, des a, 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 a descendant of David on that throne. Now, who's going to eventually uh, take the, their seat on that throne? The Lord Jesus. 
And we look forward to that day. And that day could be coming very soon, according to some. Or if you're a post-millennialist, it could be a long, long time away. Either way, there's going to be a descendant of David on that throne till, David, till Jesus comes and sits on <coughs> David's greater son. So what should we be doing meantime? First Timothy. Pray for kings and those in authority. Why? So we will be a godly, peaceable. In other words, the nation will be blessed as you pray. But here's the thing. If you're ambivalent about the monarchy or hostile to the monarchy, for whatever dumb, stupid political reason that you have, but you claim to be a Christian, you need to wise up. Amen? Amen. But those of us who know otherwise, whom God has revealed this wonderful truth to the key David, it's our responsibility to share this message and to pray for Queen Elizabeth or whoever else comes to sit in that throne. Because as long as there is sun and moon in the sky, there will be a descent of David on that throne. So why don't we just do the most sensible thing it's possible to do, which God has led us, which is to believe for a holy, godly, sold out Jesus freak on that throne. Somebody who's so extreme and zealous for the Lord and determined, and, and also very important that they know that they're a descent of David. I think that's so important. That's what we're believing God for. That's our message, that's our vision. Because in the Old Testament, when the king got right, when the head got right, kings like Josiah and Hezekiah, when they got right with God, they, they pulled the whole nation round from apostasy and backsliddenness back into revival and glory and uh, a godly environment. That's what we're believing for in Britain. And we will not be thwarted, we will not be stopped, we will not be halted until we see a shepherd king upon the throne of Israel, Britain. Amen.